My Wi Fi has also been really trash this morning. Yeah, it just told me my connection is unstable. So, yeah, that's going to be fun. How are you? I'm doing well. I am on my first day off of the summer. So, wow. I came home to celebrate mm -hmm. my birthday with him. Mm -hmm. And, so I'm recharging after a week with a lot of children time. Mm -hmm. I caught like a quarter of that, but oh, good. <laughs> this is annoying. I'm trying to find this damn quote about impressionism and I super can't. Max. Max. Are you doing anything for the fourth? I will be working. Hi, Max. Join the Zoom. I'm sorry. I just fuck up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Max was asleep. <laughs> Good. This is the content we want. Kind of six hour brain research and Max wakes up to podcast with us. Good. We're so prepared. Yeah. I think that the camp does a thing for the fourth. It's called Festival on the Fourth. So I think we will have lots of themed activities tomorrow. And I'll Good. on on it. So I'll get to enjoy the fourth of July with all my kiddos. I think it'll be cute. Well, I was having a lot of trouble uploading the stupid thing this week, as usual, so that was fun, but <laughs> it's just like, it's, the editing is fun and I enjoy it, and then it always just takes so long to figure out how to export and then upload, like it just never wants to do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. And it's always a different issue too, it's like, even when I learn from my mistakes, yeah. it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But it's okay. Then they got around to to putting things on the Instagram today. So now I'm caught up, I think. You saw that? Very nice. Ah, there he is. Let him in. Max. Is Max awake? Hello. Good morning, Max. My connection being trash today, so if you're talking. <laughs> no one's talking. You're good. Anything going on with you, Max? We had, uh, we, we uh, let in some new improv members for summer. And we woke them up at like 4 a.m. And then I went back to sleep. Nice. Yeah. Okay, well, you want to get started, Sinclair? Uh, sure. spending a lot of time with children and I decided I wanted to look at some art that was vaguely child friendly and so I decided to do some research on Faith Ringgold who's super cool. She was born in 1930 and she is still alive. She is 90 um, and she grew up in Harlem, New York during sort of the later part aftermath of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, so she was very much like steeped in that culture. Her, she's best known for her narrative story quilts. There's one of them behind her in this picture. This is a picture of just a photograph of her. I think it's just like a publicity photo, but the thing behind her in this photograph is one of her story quilts. But she's also is a painter and a writer and a performance artist. And she has, I think, like 14 children's books 
many of which were like inspired by these story quilts, which are kind of like a children's book in a different medium. A lot of them are like an illustration of a scene with some text. Um, so that kind of feels like a children's picture book. Yeah, so she lived in Harlem. Her education taught her to be an educator. Um, so she taught in the New York City public school system. And then she was an artist like all through that time. I think she mostly started creating art in like the, like really creating art in like the sixties still works I think and, and has worked for a really long time. Um, and she taught visual arts at UCSD from starting in 1987 until she retired in 2002. Um, I don't know where she lives now, but she's pretty old, but she's cool. Her influences are a lot from like cubism and impressionism, but also from African art. And she often deals with themes of racism, sexism, and segregation. So a lot of her work circles around like what it means to be a black woman, what it means to be a black mother, what it means to be a black artist, and the sort of like intersectionality of her identities there, but in a very like accessible and often kid-friendly way. She, especially in her work in like the 90s, I think, um, really utilized quilt as a medium which we can think of as kind of like, like quilting thing is like a women's art, sort of like a way to differ from like the Western canon. Um, like she has a lot of sort of dialogue with canonical media and style and um, like celebrating those influences, but also really like setting a space for herself apart from those things. And quilt is like one of the ways that she does that. I was wrong about the number of children's books. She has written and illustrated 17 children's books is what I wrote in my notes. And a lot of them are like directly drawn from her quilt work. Um, so the thing that I wanted to focus on today is a collection of quilts called the French Collection. And this is a series of 12 quilts that are all like one big narrative. And they tell the story of her fictional protagonist whose name is William Marie Simone, who is sort of like her alter ego. And William Kendall is gone. Sad. No. Yes, <laughs> 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 keep going. And Kendall. She's back. She's back. Kendall, can you hear me? Yes, I'm just cutting out a lot and my Wi-Fi is being the worst today which is yeah. awesome of it but just keep talking You're okay good. sounds good um so her protagonist in this series Lilia um is an aspiring artist she's a black woman she's a black mother and she travels to Paris during the 1920s and like meets all of these iconic artists and so this sort of story is like very much like what I was just talking about, like a black woman sort of interacting with the canon and like taking up space in that canon and also her sort of recognizing like the influences of black women in Western art history that are often like sort of overshadowed by their white male counterparts. So in this quilt, this is called Picasso's Studio. And this is one of the quilts in this French collection. It was created in 1991. I think these were all in the 90s. So she was like in her 60s creating these, which is interesting to know. And you can tell like, so the, the structure of this is there's like a big central image that's a square. And then at the top and the bottom, there's text. It's really small. Um, I can't, I couldn't find any pictures where you can read the text, but it's like a book. Like there, there's a, an illustration of a scene with sort of description of the scene and like some dialogue in the text. And the picture here, so this is in like Picasso's studio. So on the, the bottom left, we have like an old white man painting who we can assume to is Picasso. And then in his studio, there are all these like African masks. And then in the back is the Demoiselles d'Avignon which is like a classic piece of his depicting some like nice cubist nudes that are prostitutes. And then you have some other paintings in the corners. And then our protagonist is like posing for him nude in the middle of the studio. And the text 
I read like a summary of the text and it's sort of like, like some of it is like the African masks are like reassuring her and like encouraging her to like do what she wants and like calling out like his African influences, but also like her in this space as a black woman, which is like not what Picasso painted um, and sort of like this black woman, like central in the, like in central focus in a scene of like creating this like white male gaze Western art is interesting. So I have a picture of the original Picasso, which is from 1907. And yeah, this is like the nude women. They're staring at you, which is kind of creepy. Uh, Picasso was like really inspired by African masks in creating a lot of their faces, which is a, a colonial thing um, that we can recognize as like, why does he have those as like collector's items that he's inspired by in his studio? So that's that one. This is another quilt in the French collection. This is called Joe Baker's Birthday. And this she created in 1995. And so this is Josephine Baker, who was, she was a Black American expatriate working in France as a dancer entertainer during this time. And so this is like wrinkled, bringing like Black women from the period to the forefront and really celebrating them. And in the image here, there are clear references to works in the historical canon. So we have like her body position is very similar to Manet's Olympia, which we've talked about before, which is a reclining nude, this one. So like her position is a lot like this. And you have like this, a similar composition with the maid in the back. And then this scene with the maid in the back is like a Matisse painting called the dessert harmony in red and that's like very clearly what that is referencing so you have these like clear art historical references but with a black woman in the central image and this is also like sort of celebrating her like femininity and sexuality and boldness within these like references to a canon that like would not celebrate those things in a black woman and the text for this image, some of it is like Willia's words. So like our fictional protagonist talking about this, talking about Josephine Baker. And I have a quote from the text and she says, quote, the reality is that Josephine is black and they would never have let her seek fame and fortune in the States. There, her talent would be no talent at all. Her dance would be no dance at all. Her voice would be no voice at all. Her greatness would be no greatness at all. Her life would be no life, no beauty end quote. So like Ringgold clearly has like some thoughts about like the ways in which Black women are overlooked, especially in America, and like thinking about segregation, but also like undervaluing of Black women and their, their talents and their contributions. That's that one. Kendall's gone again. Rip. Rip Kendall. Rip She's Kendall. Dead. I can't believe she died like mid-podcast. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this, will, this will be a really highly listened to podcast because of that. Kendall died in the middle of our podcast. Yeah, we'll, we'll name this Kendall died during this one. <laughs> and then people will be like, it'll, it'll capture their attention. Mm -hmm. I really like the cat in this. Name. Is that all you're painting? Um, I have another quote. But it's an easy okay. Here, let's, let's go back. I'm going to make some comments. Wait. Which one do you want to see? Uh, the one with the this one. This one I really like. Mm -hmm. Just because it's like, it doesn't hold back. Like, it's very obvious. <laughs> like, that like this one, one that this is, no, the other one, that one. Like, it's pretty obvious that one is, like, situated in the background. Yeah, totally. And it's just interesting how, like, it's essentially the same image. Mm -hmm. But, like, just by the context of, like, putting it behind this new woman, it's makes it very different yeah totally and also like the composition of this one like implies that this woman in the background is her maid which right. is like a white woman serving yes woman. yes so, yeah i just wanted to say that explicitly yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Kendall's you, back. Kendall. kendall you died i know but i can hear you now i don't know she she's been resuscitated yeah. We thought we would get big ratings on this podcast because you died, but now you're alive, I guess. Yeah. Sorry, guys. That's okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah. This is really cool, though. And um, yeah. I 
this relates very well to mine actually and i'm just thinking a lot about because i'm taking two summer school classes right now that just started this week and one of them is comics reading the medium and so we're talking a lot about like what makes a comic a comic here you have text and images so that's interesting and if you're curious about that in any more detail definitely pick up understanding comics because it's an exploration of like what comics are told through comics so it's super cool but also i'm taking a class called literary impressionism and we just talked about mayonnaise olympia in our last class and this is just super interesting we read a bunch of like critical reviews for this and like because we'd always heard about in art history like how scandalous this was but i actually got to read the reviews that say like such indecency and there was one that just says like vulgar 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 like over and over and over again like As people they should yeah lots lots <laughs> of see um, that was a joke if you're not <laughs> if you're listening for the first time they or talk also oh, they talk about so the she looks like a corpse which i thought well, I have one more quilt, and this one is an AP art history work. So this is from the same series, like these are all from the same narrative. And this is called Dancing at the Louvre, and it's another quilt with text at the bottom and the top. And it shows um, our protagonist with her friend and her daughters dancing at the Louvre in front of the Mona Lisa and some sort of like Virgin Mary kind of paintings that look very like stodgy white western canon. and. Like obviously you have like black women taking up space in a building in a physical space that like they would not have and like that they usually don't. And you also have sort of, I read something about sort of like the contrasting ideas about what maternity can look like and like what being a mother is between like the paintings in the building and this sort of like more flexible maternity that we see like being acted out in this like joyous dance in the Louvre. I really like this quote as like a, an image of like black joy in a space where like blackness is not celebrated. I think that this is an AP art history work. It's pretty cool. Those are the three quotes from this 12 quote collection that I selected, but I think they're pretty awesome. And this is also, if I remember right, the inspiration for Beyonce's and Jay-Z's music video, right? Um, I think it, it at least is like an influence for that yeah 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 I can't remember what the video like which song it is but if you haven't seen that like look up Beyonce in the Louvre because it's so cool it's like this but in action kind of yeah I mean I like how this main woman this main black woman is like looking directly at the audience essentially mm -hmm. um because like we have Mona Lisa right behind her who's also looking at the audience kind of I, I i think like what i like about these quilts is like i think it like balances a good line of like tell you what she's thinking without like i don't know it's like e it's very easy to know but also it's not like uh in your face i guess i think that some of that too i, I totally get that they're like they seem like they want to be analyzed and thought about, but they also like are not too heady. Yeah. And I think also like the style sort of lends itself to that. Like right. the figures in this one are very much in like a folk style that feels very accessible and like familiar. And like, like it feels like an illustration, which I think is like really draws you in as a viewer. Like it feels very friendly. Yeah, yeah and I mean, the, the medium itself, like it's soft, yeah. like it's not, Yeah. Um, it's not like hung up in this in this like golden frame like it's just like kind of like you could you wouldn't i hope but like you throw this on your bed yeah and there's like a comfort with that too yeah. you know? like blankets are used for warmth and like that's also a familial thing like my grandma made all of her grandchildren quilts so i don't yeah. know it's definitely i i just i love that like like texture and the I don't know. There's so much there. I think that's really beautiful. This and one even, definitely feels like very like cozy and warm to me. Yeah. And all the like text on these she hand wrote and like it it all feels very like personal. Right. And 
also like like what i think is this really like beautiful piece of art that's also within like the borders that she has on this quilt which are like very classic like flowery quilt borders i don't know something about that just makes it feel very like grounded yeah which also could call back to like illuminated manuscripts you know and their borders and stuff yeah oh that's true she's definitely she's coming pulling. back to illuminated manuscripts yeah <laughs> we can't escape them i know i don't even we like them as much but hey don't don't you I'm not, about to, I'm not about to defend the Lumion manuscript. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to upset the monks. Um, now a less artistic comment. I want to see the other side of this quilt. I want to see yeah. what the other side of the quilt looks like. Yeah. That's is it good. like? Yeah. Is it just the border? I don't know. Is it? Is it like a rug, where it's like? Yeah. <laughs> well, have you? I seen assume it? it's complete. I guess for reference. I've done some embroidery, and this is the front of something. Yeah. I no, I'm. Do. Yes. Back. Oh. Um, well, so it's very clean on the back. Well, I do it really messily because I don't care. I can change. This is one of my better ones, but some of them are super, super messy. Um. Yeah, I have one in the cabinet I could get and show you, but you have all the like kind of rougherness to it. So I, I, I think that's a good question because they. I wonder what that like adds or takes away from the piece, seeing it from that other angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm watching the Louvre music video. <laughs> it's called the Carter's Ape Shit. Oh, Ape Shit, that's right. That's what I have for you today. Yeah, I wish we explored her more in our AP or history class because because she's one of the later ones we didn't really get to like go in depth yeah i think that dancing at the loop was one of my bigger ones but i didn't do that much on it and i think she's really cool i think these ones especially are cool because they're mm -hmm. like so directly referencing other things yeah i love that I love <laughs> one of my favorite things about her is when it talks about other art <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna talk about an impressionist. Um, she's also a woman, which is fun. Cause I was like, I haven't done a woman in a while. And this is Berthe Morisot. She's an impressionist. Let me just get into it. Okay, this is the one I kind of chose. It's called The Cradle and it's in the Musée d'Orsay. And um, she and her sister Edma uh, had hoped to be professional artists, um, not just women with hobbies of art, but they wanted to do it professionally. <laughs> she, so they both studied, their mom provided them with an artistic education, which is cool and not very common. So she must have been like upper middle class, if not upper class because of this, because the people that have time to make art are rarely the people that are also working. Her sister, however, gave up on her professional dreams and got married and just gave up on that completely. Berthe uh, got married to uh, Eugène Manet, so uh, Manet's younger brother. They were married, which I had forgotten about, but she still kept doing her art thing, so marriage did not stop her. And she created lots of these kinds of very impressionistic style, so like visible brushstrokes, kind of soft, it's quickly done um, to capture the quote-unquote impression or the feeling um, or the idea of whatever it is she's looking at. And her work specifically, most of them are inside or outside, which I guess is the only two options. Um, but like she has a lot of works that deal with the in-between space in that way because uh, there's so many pictures, I probably should have included them, of like Venetian women like looking out of windows or like standing in the frame of a window like women are very very often portrayed inside or looking out but never in the outside and so she kind of like plays with that notion in this one which is called in England or en Angleterre in French um, and 
you have like a man actually looking out a window at two women who are outside on a balcony or on a like boardwalk it looks like and also very impressionistic style and she definitely added to that whole movement probably the most well-known female impressionist i would guess um though i'm not an expert and yes that's one of the things i think is the most interesting is like her choice of subject is so radically different than most of the impressionists because the rest of them were basically all men and a lot of theirs are outside like en plein air and like just you know lily pads uh harbors all of these scenes that like women don't necessarily exist in and so she kind of grapples with that notion in kind of the same way that faith ringwald does um of like is it ringgold yeah okay ringgold I was saying like Molly Ringwald. <laughs> yeah, in the same way of like questioning who is in what spaces and therefore who can capture what art in what spaces. Yeah, she made her public debut in 1864 in a Paris salon. So during the Impressionistic movement, basically all art that was like seen as notable had to be presented in a salon, which is like a big room. They would show off all the paintings and critics and people of the art world, other artists would go and look at all the paintings and kind of judge them and critique them, which is the scenario in which Manet's Olympia became so, so, so controversial. Yeah, and then she met Manet in 1868, and then I think shortly after married his younger brother, she joined the Parisian avant-garde movement, and then in 1874, she joined Radical New Artists Cooperative, and she was the only female artist to show in the first exhibition there. Yeah, the group was dubbed the Impressionist by critics. I was trying to find the quote from that, but I could not. But basically, it's just some guy saying, no, they just want to show the impression. And then it became a whole thing. Oh, yeah. Morisot is also known for painting, like, the, the Parisienne, they call it, like, the female Parisian. And I don't really have a good image of that, so let me find one. She did all of these, like, modern city women. And also, I think, interestingly, depicted them not as sex objects, but just as women doing women things, you know, <laughs> and just like living their lives. So you have, and a lot of them are also like looking directly at you. Here's a reclining nude that probably is playing with the idea of uh, Manny's Olympia. There are some scenes outside too, which often deal with women and children. Beth had one daughter who, oh yeah, Mary Cassa is the other like famous female impressionist and those are like the big two. She had this daughter named Julie and Julie is pictured, pretty sure that's Julie, but Julie is also in this one. This is a later work and you see, like I saw something talking about how she, you see that's kind of moving into this whole like symbolist movement as well with like the kind of expressionistic background that shows like the emotion of her figure, her model, I guess. And she painted her daughter, Julie, a lot. This I'm assuming is also Julie, like the mother with the daughter in the cradle, which I thought was a really interesting like kind of flip or like bouleverse in French on like uh, the Madonna and child image because like rather than having her like child at the breast she's just like kind of looking down at her baby in a cradle with this like ethereal um, what would you call it like piece of fabric hanging over the cradle and just kind of like gazing at her in a very like I don't know it feels like a soft loving relationship but also maybe a little bit cold because there's no like physical touch happening between them. Yeah, so her later work becomes more like free and abstracted. Like this is one of her famous later works. Um, it's just like the portrait in the center is very impressionistic, but then as it goes out from the portrait, it's just like brush strokes on paper and it's not completely filled in. It seems more unfinished. Um, so she's starting to play with abstraction more and more. Yeah, so she liked these in-between spaces because I'm sure she felt like an in-between kind of person, you know, like she's not allowed to belong in either of these places. 
she didn't have a studio, but instead worked um, either en plein air or in her bedroom or her drawing room. And I saw a quote that said that she would like move aside all of her painting stuff so that she could live her daily life. Like it seems like painting is the top priority and then like living her life is second, which I thought was interesting and telling. She did achieve significant critical recognition within her lifetime, which is pretty impressive for a woman at this time. Lots of focus on femininity. Some of these like feminine qualities <laughs> that were depicted. Uh, one of the articles told me that feminine qualities are intuitiveness, spontaneity, and delicacy, which I was like, okay, interesting, whatever. It's not necessarily wrong, but I'm also like, I don't get how like intuitiveness and spontaneity are seen as feminine. It's silly anyway. Oh yeah, and then her and Manet and uh, Eva Gonzalez, who I did not know of, but might research later, they all in this later period started painting on unprimed canvases, which was also a thing. So giving it this kind of like sketchier look and less finished and less polished. So again, moving towards emotions rather than realism which is kind of in opposition to painters like Ancre, who made very, very like statuesque portraits and was also working at the same time. And he was in huge opposition to Delacroix, who was much more attractive than him. Um, and there's lots of like cartoons about it um, because, wait, let me, let me find it. We were talking about this in class. Um, but they like do not like each other. These are self portraits of verses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and this is the cartoon we looked at. Um, so, this caricature of Delacroix and Angre um, dueling in front of the Institute of France, and Delacroix um, says, "Line is color," and Angre says, "Color is utopia. Long live line." They did. They did them dirty with that. They really did. Like you can tell which side. <laughs> is on in this one yeah. <laughs> look at how bad he looks what is it? but yeah so Anku was really into line as you can see and like everything is clear separated um hyper realistic there's a couple that really just look like statues of his and Anku is very like rigid he's upholding all of these ideas of the past um oh yeah la grande odalisque is like one of his most famous, which is also, I'm pretty sure, an AP art history work. Oh, this is the kind of uh, female picture I was talking about with like a woman inside some kind of window or frame. Um, this is very, very typical way to depict women in art. Yeah, so he's very into line. He's like, everything needs to be sketched first. And then all these Impressionists and Delacroix come along and they're like, no, like color is what makes that. Like you look out in nature and there, there's no lines in nature. Like it's just colors up against each other. So that's yeah. a big debate happening at this time. So that's basically all I have. I can just show you these slides in more detail. This is the Cage from 1885, it's oil on canvas. And this one is an interesting still life. It's a bird cage. There's a lot of talk of like the inside and outside within this. And like, uh, there's something about like voids, I guess, which maybe refers to the background because um, it doesn't seem necessarily situated anywhere. It's just kind of like in space, but this just looks like a really beautiful study of a bird cage with two little birdies inside. Um, is it? Hmm. Is it two, or is it one, Ooh. and the reflection of one? That's a good question, Max. I don't know. And the I, title. I feel like. Oh what? I said the title doesn't help us there, so I don't yeah. know. But it very well because they're kind of like pointing in at each other, almost as if. I yeah. mean, I don't know. I don't see like that would fit in but when no, I, I first saw it I was like that looks like it maybe is one yeah I think you're definitely on to something um I'll show you the maybe it's about the bird's existence within um and but out of the kids also very famous for this painting if it will load properly yeah um 
which is called like uh, the psych mirror or psyche mirror. Yeah, devant la psyche, in front of the psyche. And so I guess had like lots of studies. That's cool. Uh, lots of studies of different um, mirrors and such. So she definitely is interested in that idea. So it's very possible that that's a bird being reflected because the way it looks together and also one of them doesn't look like it's inside the bars. Right. Um, so I think you're definitely onto something there. And then the last one I have is just this portrait of uh, Julie also. And she's, um, this one is definitely more like a sketch and she's looking outside. She's in a red apron. It's called Child in a Red Apron. Enfant on an, I don't know what apron is in French. Um, <laughs> and there's some trees and it looks like she's almost holding a camera, but I doubt it. Um, but I don't know what she's actually holding there or maybe like binoculars looking out or something like that. But yeah, so again, one of these like in between looking out or looking in kind of questions. Um, so yeah, that is uh, Beth Moiso. And uh, I guess my sources were the Barnes Foundation and MWA Art. There were lots of Lots of different sources about this. She's very well documented um, because she was popular at the time she was alive. Uh, but I didn't find that much like wild stuff. Like most of it just kind of said the same thing. So yeah, but I think she's cool and interesting. And also a woman like breaking into a space where she's not necessarily allowed, but now is well respected because she's a white woman. Uh, so. I like the brush strokes. Yeah. I mean, so many people love Impressionism also. Like, it's one of yeah, the most... you know me. Yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> me. In our episode, how yeah. it's a basic thing. You because... know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's like, probably, if you ask anyone, regardless of their knowledge of art history, it's probably the most likely to be the favorite genre. And I would posit that's because it's one of the Because most... it's cool? Yes. <laughs> so I think it's because it's one of the most accessible genres of art. Cause also, yeah. Yeah, it's about emotion. Because <laughs> it's about emotion and it's about like, um, like you're looking at a realistic thing, but you're looking at it through the lens of whatever emotion the artist had. So it's kind of like traditional art history plus this lens of like emotion, which I think right. is very appealing. Well, I think uh, people like skin brush strokes. <laughs> I think no, I think uh yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, and but they didn't like also, seeing that's yeah. the thing. It's like it used to be really controversial and they were like, no, that's ugly. Like that's you're doing art wrong. Well, I think for people that aren't like into art, mm -hmm. it's kind of it it like kind of makes more sense for them because it makes it like separate itself as a medium mm -hmm. more. So I mean maybe I don't know. No, I think, I'm just, I think that's that's a good point. Like for the modern viewer, it's like so yeah. I mean like real realism that looks right. like photography and like modern art makes no sense. Yeah. It feels like art. Like it feels like right. I think, point of view. Yeah, it, it kind of Yeah, it just makes like for the person who's like consuming a lot of other things, like it's kind of makes sense for them. Yeah, because it's like it's art with and it calls to itself as art because you can see the brush strokes but it's not like, and it's like realistic portraits yeah which feel kind of boring i think to us now because yeah. they're so realistic that it's like why didn't you just take a photo yeah or modern yeah. we don't we don't quite like we know but we don't quite understand yeah and that power to depict realism is not so amazing for us as modern yeah. Yeah, screw Michael Rosen. So. Yeah. <laughs> Mike take that out of the podcast. Too, like, really <laughs> I like Mike's art. No, Mike's. I. I'm just. I. Yeah, I love. I love my dad's art. <laughs> <laughs> that was me playing a character when I said that. Oh, of course. So I don't. You got to put on a hat when you're. No, playing. well, you know, let's talk about Mike's art. Actually, this is what I'm going to bring to the table today, since I have nothing today. Okay. Um, Mike's art. You know, maybe I'll show some. Maybe maybe this is a conflict of interest, but maybe I'll show some. <laughs> conflict um, of interest? How? I don't know. Okay. This is an ad yeah. to buy my dad's art. 
so I can go to school. <laughs> um, Help Max go to school. Yeah, fund my school. Fund Max's philosophy degree. Yeah, fund my useless degree. <laughs> Um, my dad's ours at dirigibleturtle.com. Dirigibles are a type of Zeppelin. Uh, my dad mostly paints Zeppelins. Well, kind of, well, you know what? Let's just talk about my dad's art career. I, I haven't asked him about this, but so I'm scrolling through a lot of things right now. Ignore those for now. Um, I would say, like, the middle bulk of my dad's career, which is a very long time, I would say, like, five years ago the 20 years before that are probably like this style um he kind of does these like realistic paintings centered on zeppelins but with and they're all in black and white but they do have a little color in them mm -hmm. essentially how he does all his paintings is he paints them in color first mm -hmm. um and then he paints over them in black and white Oh, really? And it's an interesting process to see, like, when I go into my dad's studio, sometimes yeah. I'm like, you should just leave that because it looks cool. But it's yeah. not about that. It's about um, making this thing, even though, if, even if you don't get to, like, see of course. Uh, all the intricacies, like, this is what comes out of it. Is the Zeppelin, like, a World War II fascination thing for him? I don't really, I'm going to be honest, I've asked him a lot of times, and he's told me a lot of times, but I forget at this current moment. <laughs> okay, um, tell us next week, Max. From a viewer who has forgotten what it's about, Yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of, I think, like, it kind of has a lot to do with uh, noir, almost. Mm -hmm. Like, most of his paintings are over cities, mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of like this completely usually this like completely man-made landscape and we have the zeppelins which are like kind of looming over them and i feel like anytime there's a zeppelin there's a sense of like something is happening like it's not like just a thing like it's not just like oh it's a plan no i think looming is a great word yeah. to describe it yeah like you get this like heaviness from it and for me at least it conjures like the idea of like bombings yeah it's in wartime maybe too Oh, here's some dates. 1990 to 2006 was uh, like he was doing Zeppelins, but he was also doing these very surreal pieces of art. A lot of them like mixing mm -hmm. like really big natural objects within the city. <laughs> There's also some, here's some like plays on like some corporate like serials and stuff. I've talked about uh, this. This is one. Well, is it the Captain Crunch one here? There's see. one with Captain Crunch. This one's kind of similar. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like Captain Crunch is like a war captain and he's like with this military thing. And it's just like the same as this one where it's like it looks so innocent, but in the background, like this gun that this cartoon character is holding is now being like within the context of this like old timey war. Something about corporations, something about. Yeah. And then recently, he's been doing some kind of return to those surreal images. I want one of those. But also, they're 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 more realistic, surreal. Like they're almost like is like it it's meant like to be surreal. Like yeah, this yeah. is actually auto. This is modeled after auto. I want an auto portrait. Um, this is the two ten going west to Arcadia. Do you think if I sent your dad pictures of our tortoises? and commissioned him to paint you could definitely do that i'm super gonna do that i really want portraits of this yeah. sort of people people have commissioned him to do things sometimes wait max did he take a picture while driving to create that um a lot of times he'll <laughs> model things off of a picture so probably the, yes i mean like these wait, two things i can tell you that turtle in the road and stop driving and paint it in the car yeah <laughs> you there uh, maybe not i can tell you at this one like in his studio he had a picture of auto hung up and he had a picture of the 210 like hung up and he just kind of like looked at him i like that and then yeah it, like these two ones are kind of interesting because it's like are they that big like are they the size of the city 
maybe not but also like this perspective of, like the hummingbird Cause it is could the humming, be- like is a hummingbird downtown probably not oh here's an interesting play because here's a zeppelin but it's also like butterfly it's a butterfly cocoon you get, you, really interesting, you get what's though. going on yeah. uh here's another one based out auto i want it, this is probably la this is probably like city of industry or something i want to get good enough at art that i could just paint my pets all the time really well but i can paint trees and that's about it all right that's all i have to contribute that was interesting i'm sure mike will appreciate yeah. the plug <laughs> yeah. um, i think that's all we got then all right someone oh wait he's also that. gonna be on a tv show soon what TV uh, show? i i don't know like a few years ago some people came and like did this huge like interview thing with him like they were doing like an artist series where they do an episode on an artist like every episode is a new living artist it like never got released because it was just like tied up in production and like different and like different people wanted it but now it's going to be released on some streaming platform i don't know when or which streaming platform it might be like a really under the it might be like a really weird streaming platform but it's Tell happening it find out yeah yeah all right well someone want to do the wrap up or you want me to do it i'll take that as i have to do it um, <laughs> okay uh thank you so much for listening guys um yeah. find us on all podcasting platforms under paint on canvas on tape uh our instagram handle is at paint on canvas on tape with underscores in between all the words all lowercase you can email me for now at kendallcully at gmail.com i keep trying to create a gmail and then i forget and email kendall your thoughts on underscores yeah. and instagram usernames i would love to see that tell me what you think about that <laughs> Because Matt said it should have been periods, so. No, I said it shouldn't have had anything. I think it should have just oh. been no spaces. One big word? Oh my yeah. That's gross to me. It's much cleaner. It's underscores are outdated in this day and age. That's... Who are you seeing that's using underscores? I don't know. I think I got it from all the CS classes I took because you use yeah. underscores a lot for titles and things. But sure. anything else? I think that's it. Oh, go listen to our episode with Katie if you haven't already. That was yeah, great. that one's pretty good. Yeah, and the last one I did was about Satan, if you didn't listen to that yet. Yeah. I still have to upload it, but when you're listening to this. We're alienating our Christian viewership. That's the goal. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah, okay. Goodbye. Right, bye, everyone. Bye. Go get some sleep. <laughs>